Isn't worship a small way of saying thank you? It is. And I think that we're ready to worship. I think the band's ready. I think they're ready. So join us in worship. Well, good morning, Bear Creek. It's so, so good to be able to connect with you through through our platform, whether you're watching us on YouTube, Facebook, our church online platform, our website, whatever that is. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for getting a few minutes of your Sunday morning to be able to unite, to commune, to come together in unity with our church family. So I want to encourage you today to worship. I know that means a, a, a quite a different thing in 2020, but I really want to challenge you and invite you this morning to take action. Maybe that means grabbing your family, sitting them down in front of that TV. Maybe that means pausing what you're doing. Maybe that means getting up off your bed. Let's sing together. I'll raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I'll raise a hallelujah oh, louder than the unbelief. Come on, help us sing. I'll raise. I'll raise. Sing, I raise.
Amen. We raise, we raise our song, we raise our praise, we raise our worship. And I really do hope that this morning that you're raising your hallelujah, that you're raising that song of praise, that you're raising, that there's a new song on your lips today, a song of thanksgiving. Amen. And I know that may be a little bit hard in our format of being online. I know that that may take a little bit of more work for you to be able to focus. Um, but, but you know what? That's sacrificial worship, and that's what the Lord is pleased with. In fact, there's a verse in Hebrews in, in chapter 13, verse 15. I'm going to read it to you. It says, Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to Him, not to anybody else, but to Christ. And also it says in verse 16, And don't forget to do good and to share with those in need. These are the sacrifices that pleases God. And so today, as you're worshiping, know that it's sacrificial. If it costs you a little bit more, it has a little bit more weight to it, right? And so I encourage you to, to raise your hallelujah, to lift your praise. And on that same note of sacrificial worship, we're going to continue to worship in a sacrificial way through our tithes and our offerings. And so you're going to see a few ways to be able to give that on the bottom of your screen. And over this next song that we're going to sing, why don't you take that time to be able to give back sacrificially to the Lord. And, and, and that is a way that you're able to worship today. So we're going to sing this song, and I encourage you to do exactly that.
seen you move, Lord. You move the mountains. You turn rivers into highways. Only you can do it, Lord. And we believe that that's our faith arising in us. That's us increasing. It's our faith in you, Lord. That's us saying, doesn't matter what I see around me. That's us saying, doesn't matter even what I'm feeling this morning. I will put my faith in the God of miracles, the God that can move mountains. He's done it before. He can do it again. That is faith. God, and we put our faith in you. We put our trust in you. We hold tight to your promises that do not fail, God. Even when there's chaos around us, when there's turbulence around us, we recognize who is in control, and that is you, Jesus. God, so we ask that today that you do what only you can do, what you're famous for, what you've done before over and over again in our lives. Speak to us now, Lord. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for worshiping with us today. It's going to be definitely wrong with 26. Go down to 2,000 feet, please. Be down to 2,000. everybody. Welcome. So grateful that you're in this service. We're gathered. We are together. We're not in the same room, but we're together. We're worshiping the Lord. You know, I haven't heard uh, a lot of people mention this, but you know, even the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians said to that church that when you gather, even though I'm not going to be there, I'll be with you in spirit. There is a way to have a, a spiritual community, even though you're not in the same room, and I think we experience that uh, here. So I want to welcome you to the service, and I think already you've heard how to connect. I hope you'll take advantage of that. Uh, find the Connect With Us button, and just let us know that, that, uh, you're, um, uh, that you're engaged with us. If you're new, if you have a prayer need, please feel free to share that need. You have some people in this fellowship who believe in the power of prayer. They see God do great things, and so please uh, let us pray with you if if that's a need in your life. So um, you've already heard there's some great news, and that is uh, we have a date for regathering, except I guess in our case, we have a date for re regathering. And that date is uh, August Sunday, August the 30th. Sunday, uh, August the 30th, it'll be, uh, it'll be a worship-only experience. It's slightly modified, so you want to go out to our website, bearcreek.church. Click on Regather, and you'll see all of the details there. We're very excited about that day. And if you're ready to regather, there's your, there's your date. Put that um, uh, on your calendar. Um, excellent. Well, we've been in this summer series for now, I think, uh, six weeks. And, uh, and the summer series has been called Turbulence. And, and Turbulence, the series, has been about this, what to do when your life hits really significant uh, turbulence. And so we've worked our way through just like six individual principles. This is their, their behaviors. Do this. Do this when your life encounters um, uh, significant turbulence. And so we're, we're still working on that principle six, number six. And so I took you to a passage last time. We're going to be back in that, and we're going to finish out the principle, that principle today. So the name Stanislav Petrov probably doesn't mean that much to you. But do you know that Stanislav Petrov probably saved your life? Or at least your parents' lives, which means he saved your life too. In fact, Stanislav Petrov may have saved, may have saved the entire world 
September 26, 1983, because he was the duty officer uh, that night in the Soviet Union's missile early warning system when he suddenly got a signal from a secret satellite system that the U.S. had just fired a ballistic missile from somewhere in the North American continent uh, headed or pointed to the Soviet Union. Um, it was already an incredibly tense time uh, in the midst of the Cold World in 1983 uh, uh, because just three weeks before the Soviet Union had actually shot down a commercial flight uh, that had accidentally strayed into the Soviet airspace. And so the Russian military was incredibly nervous and they thought the U.S. might retaliate at any moment. But then it, it got worse. Petrov received a second warning that another missile had been launched. And then another, and then another, and then a fifth one. And he knew his orders, they were clear, to sound the alarm for immediate retaliatory strike. But he didn't do that. For almost five full minutes, which felt like a lifetime to him, he slowed it down and he evaluated the information that he had on hand. He quickly made a judgment and he did not sound the alarm. First, he looked, at, um, he looked for corroborating evidence in land-based um, uh, radar. Couldn't find it. He also reasoned out very quickly that a five-missile strike would not be the way that the U.S. would attack. In fact, logic said to him, that it would be an all-or-nothing strike. And so Petrov, uh, so Petrov saved potentially the world by refusing to panic, and he did nothing. It turned out that that night it was a malfunction in the Soviet satellite warning system. Do you know that that incident was not known for almost 30 years, not known publicly for almost 30 years? But when it was revealed, every military expert was amazed at Petrov's poise, his ability to think so clearly in just a couple uh, of moments, his courage to take such a risk of not sounding the alarm. He refused to panic, and it might have saved the world. And that's the big idea the last big idea that we began working on last time in this series called turbulence. Because look, turbulence can make you panic. And if you panic, you'll make terrible decisions, big mistakes with awful consequences. And so last time we turned to a real world incident in the life of Jesus to show us, to show us this, that as a Christ follower, you have an equipping uh, and that equipping gives us a kind of poise, a clarity, a calmness, even in the midst of horrendous turbulence. And so, Jesus, in this passage that we're going to read, we started uh, last time, he's about to put his disciples through a real-world exercise to show them that they have everything they need to face any turbulence in their life uh, if, if, if they put their total trust in him. And so it happens in Mark 4. This is early in Jesus' ministry. And so the context, here it is. This is after several days, nonstop days of spiritually, mentally, physically exhausting days uh, of Jesus just pouring himself out into people's life and in teaching and healing and casting out demons. And so he gives a simple instruction to his disciples. Mark 4, starting in verse 35. Listen to the word of God. So it says, verse 35, on that day when evening came, end of the day. He said to them, his disciples, let's go over to the other side. It means the Sea of Galilee. He's in that northwest corner where the fishing villages are. Capernaum is kind of the center spot there. And so he's saying, let's cast off from there and go over to the eastern shore, sort of to the Gadarenes area. And so leaving the crowd, they took him along with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And, and there arose a fierce gale of wind. Do you remember last time? A hurricane mega wind, if you read it literally in the text. And, and, and the waves were breaking over the, over the boat so much that it was already filling up. 
verse 38. Jesus himself was in the stern, the back of the boat, asleep on a cushion. And they woke him and they said to him, teacher, do you not care that we're perishing? And he got up and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, hush, be still. Two words in the, in the biblical text, hush, be still. And the wind died down and it, meaning the sea, became perfectly calm. And he said to them, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? And then they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so this is the word of God and it's supernatural. It speaks supernaturally. It has a power in it if we just expose our lives to it. And look at what it speaks in the in the. In the real world circumstance here, look what it speaks. That if we believe in his power, big idea, that if we believe in his power and we trust in his love, then it defeats the panic. That's the big idea. And so there are these three uh, like spiritual building blocks that sort of flow out of that for defeating panic in the midst of turbulence. And so what are they? So look, these are either building blocks or they could be spiritual disciplines or both. And so I'm going to take you through exactly the same two that we did last time, except with fresh insight, and then we're going to add the third, the the, the point that means everything. And so so how do we uh, defeat the panic uh, when we face significant turbulence? Well, in this real world incident, It comes this way by first believing in his power. And that's what's going on in verses 37, 38, 39. Um, You see this fierce gale, this fierce wind, and it begins to pour energy into the lake, and the waves are just crashing over the boat in a way that it's going to sink it. And so we said we said there were two powers on that lake that night, and one was the storm. And there may not be a more powerful phenomenon in all of nature than huge waves that, that heave up and crash down, that can, that can pick up a 30-foot boat like the one that the disciples were presumably in, that can just pick it up and drop it down like a little toy, that can just sop, uh, that, that can absolutely sink it in a single wave, just fill it with water in an instant. And Jesus and his disciples were caught up in the middle of a violent storm that, that, that swirled up in just a few moments. And the waves were large enough that it threatened to take them under in the next few moments. And look, these were seasoned fishermen. They'd spent their lives on this lake. And they were, by the time they wake Jesus up, they're crying like babies powerful phenomena and 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 look at it there are these these natural there are these natural expressions of power that come over your life over and over in your life and they are huge that you you look like a little toy in comparison to them but there was a second power present in the boat that night and that power was asleep on a cushion in the back of the boat while it was being tossed around in a turbulent storm. And it's just incredible. It's incredible to me to think that Jesus was asleep in the midst of all of that chaos, but it was evidence of something. It's evidence of the power that he is and the power that he possessed. And so, look, it it was a power of spirit. It was a power of peace. It was a power of knowing how loved he was by his Father in heaven, and so he could sleep. Because he was already convinced that nothing could come into his life that his father had not already equipped him for and empowered him to face and overcome. That it, that's what his sleep means. So he slept. Verse 38, but, uh, ver- 38, but they wake him up. They wake him up and they say, we are perishing. Very nice way of saying, we're dying here. 
And look at what Jesus does. Just the simplicity. We talked about this part last time. He stands up. He says two words. And they are actually to each of the forces that are going on there. To the wind. He says, hush. And it stops. Dead silent. And he says to the rolling sea of, of Galilee, be still. And it's like glass. I mean, he spoke just two words. He spoke to the storm and the sea, he spoke to them like unruly children. And it, and it was like this powerful force of nature just obeyed him. And, 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 and the disciples see it before their eyes. We thought the wind and the sea were the incomparable powers in our life, these natural powers that come against our life. It, was, it, it threatened to take our life in the next moment, but, but actually the most incomparable power was the power asleep in the back of the boat. And when, and, and when we went to him, when we went to him, he overcame all of that. I think that Christ, in fact, was orchestrating this event, these events. To give his disciples a real world experience of something so essential in their lives, their spiritual lives, that, that, he, that he just had to put them through a live fire drill in, in order for them to learn it. I think he knew the storm was coming, and I think he deliberately put them out on the lake to encounter it, and I think he deliberately took a nap in the middle of it to take his disciples through something absolutely crucial to their ability to live supernaturally in this world against such natural powers. And so he's showing them that he's the only power. First of all, he's showing them that he is the only incomparable power and that he loves them. And that they should, they, they should turn to him. They should turn to him for his power in their lives, in their circumstances, in their relationships, in their everything. And the text should be speaking into your life at this moment. To believe in that power, not as an abstract concept. It's the wrong, it's the wrong application for you to look at this passage and, and realize that it's a real world incident and go, yeah, oh yeah, the, that implication is right. If Jesus is God, then he must have power over creation and therefore he should be able to calm a storm. That's not it. That's it, but that's not all of it. The implication is that you should, I should, we should surrender our lives. I should surrender my will. I should surrender my emotions to him as ruler of my life. To believe his power is available to my life, my circumstances, my relationships, everything in my life, and to, and to, and to come to believe that that power is operating in me, for me, all around me. And there is only one way to tap into it, and that is to surrender to his lordship in my life. He is ruler of my mind, heart, and emotions. He is ruler, not me. But there's a second building block, a second spiritual discipline for defeating panic in your life when turbulence comes. And that second one is to trust in his love, to trust in his love. And so that's going on in verses 38 and 39. He's asleep in the stern. His disciples wake him and say, teacher, do you not care? Do you not care that we're perishing? I think Jesus makes them ask a crucial question. I think he makes them ask it. I think he's orchestrating the events. And I think it is in order to make them ask a critical question. And, and to ask it in a way that it is most meaningful in their, li their life. So that it's not theoretical for them. To ask it so that the answer, so that the answer is the most meaningful thing in their life. 
And so it takes a storm for them to ask him this directly. Do you care that we're dying out here? In the midst of my storm, do you care that I'm dying out here? Because Jesus is doing something so important, he's clearing up forever the question that you and I will have every, every, have every single time a storm enters our lives. God, here I am trying to be faithful to you. I put my faith in you, but, but then this storm overtakes my life. What does that mean? I mean, what is that? Are you unaware of it? Are you not involved in my life? Or is it that you simply don't care? He's going to clear that up for them immediately. And so Jesus is orchestrating these events to clear up the biggest misunderstanding about God ever, and that is, if things aren't going great in my life, God must not love me. That's patently false. Listen, storms do not mean that God is asleep, unaware, or doesn't care. In the storms, as followers of Jesus, you have a greater power residing in you and around you than any natural power in the, on this planet. Stronger than a storm. Stronger than a sickness. Stronger than a pandemic. Stronger than a loss. Stronger than anything that can happen to you. And the difference between those two powers is that the power in you loves you beyond your comprehension. And so therefore will protect you in the storm or use the storm to make you stronger or, or make your soul more beautiful or for your ultimate good. And so what do you do? How do you trust in his love? Well, just keep reminding yourself of the fact that he has already declared his love over you. The most direct way I've ever read it in all of the Bibles, Isaiah 43, and I shared this last time. God just says to his people, you are precious in my sight. Really, since you are precious in my sight, and since you are honored, and I love you, He's declared his love for you. So keep reminding yourself of that, of that he has declared his love for you. And then keep affirming your trust in that love. Keep affirming your trust. The best way to do that is just to think Romans 8, 38 and 39. Just, that's the way to keep, just keep reaffirming your trust in it. Do you remember the Apostle Paul writes for us uh, Romans 8, 38, I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate me from God's love. Not death, not life, not angels or demons, not my fear for today or my worry for tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate me from God's love. No power in the sky above or the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate me from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus my His greatest declaration of love is that he so loved the world that he sent Christ to die for me in my place on the cross, to forgive me of all of my sin, to place eternal life in me, to give me the spiritual power to face, overcome, walk through any storm that defeats the panic. And now the last principle, the last building block, the, the last, the last uh, uh, spiritual discipline. Number three, that defeats the panic. This defeats the panic. Verses 41 and 40 and 41. And so he said to them, why are you afraid? And how is it that you have no faith? And they became very much afraid and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now, enter back into that boat, into that moment. They're shaking Jesus. Do you not care? Do you not care that, um, that we're perishing here? Jesus stands up with two words, Hush to the wind, be still to the water. And then, and then he turns up. Then he turns to his disciples, and what does he say? What, what, what is it that he, he, he says? Uh, does he say, oh, wait, wait, oh, I'm so sorry. 
That must have been really scary for you. Isn't it interesting that it's not what he does? Verse 40, he answers with his own question. I mean, the, the only thing that comes out of his mouth is, why are you afraid? How is it that you have no faith? His question could equally be translated, a legitimate way to translate that question, how is it that you have no faith? A legitimate way to translate that is, where is your faith? I love the implication of that. Where is your faith? Because you know what he's asking? Where'd you put it? Why don't you get it out and use it? I mean, get what's going on here. The disciples say to him, essentially, Jesus, you've gone to sleep on us in my storm. You've gone to sleep on me. And Jesus responds, no, it is you that's gone to sleep on me. That's how it applies to you. I've given you all of the evidence you could ever want to believe in my power and trust in my love. Do you get that? Faith is not a mist, some, some ethereal mist that, that, sort of, that sort of strangely comes into your life and goes out of it. Do you know that faith is confidence built on evidence? And Jesus is essentially saying to them, I've given you all the evidence you could ever want to believe in my power and to trust in my love. And how do we know that? Mark 1, 2, and 3. This is Mark 4. <laughs> how do we know that? Jesus has just begun his ministry. And those three chapters are packed full of all the evidence that the disciples could ever need to believe in the power of Christ and to see his love for them and for everyone that his life touched. I mean, I mean the demons... When Jesus went and encountered them, the demons just kept crying out when they encountered him. We know who you are, Jesus, Son of God. Are you going to torment us? And he would, he would cast them out. He was casting them out of so many soul-tortured people. He healed hundreds of people in just the first three chapters of Mark. And the disciples, and the disciples were eyewitnesses of it. They were huddled around him. They watched him over and over. What do I mean? Paralytics who... who had been paralyzed for many, many years, carried on a, on a cot. He just touches them, and they stand, and they walk. Lepers whose skin are healed right before their eyes, withered limbs restored in their sight, all kinds of sicknesses healed in a moment, not once, not five times, not 28 times, over and over and over and over for, for three full chapter, chapters. And so I think all of that, funnels to this singular incident. The whole incident happens, Jesus says, to teach this one thing, to teach you and me just this one thing. Why don't you just get your faith out and use it? It could very, it, listen, it's a very real possibility that Jesus hasn't gone to sleep on your storm. It is more likely that we've gone to sleep on him. A huge part of faith is just thinking correctly about God. If he is supremely powerful, if he loves me beyond my ability to comprehend, then he will protect me and grow me and turn this storm to my ultimate good in the end. And Jesus may be saying this to you too. I've given you all of the evidence that you could ever need to believe in my power and to trust in my love. So don't go to sleep on me. Because faith is simple trust. Because I've seen enough evidence that Christ is who he says he is. Faith is simple trust trust that this storm is temporary and that and 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 maybe may look maybe it can take some things away from me but it can not destroy me dr martin lord jones was a great intellectual theologian of the 20th century 
And I love one of his definitions of faith. You need to carry this out of this message. You need to carry this out into your life starting this moment. Faith is simply a refusal to panic. Let's bow together. And I want to ask you, wherever you are, if you would be open to sincerely bow. And just pray for a moment. This is how you connect to the creator of the universe, by prayer. And I want to invite you, if you've never asked Christ into your life, if you've never surrendered your life and placed your faith into Christ, that this would be the moment that you would do that. And for you, maybe maybe it's just not made a lot of sense in the past, or maybe you've just sort of been victim to what some people say, and they say that because they don't want any rulership in their life, so they have to say, Jesus, it doesn't matter. But you can see from a real-world incident the power and the love of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit is just tapping into your heart right now, drawing you out, and, and And there's just this rush inside of you that says, I need that. And this is your moment to ask Christ into your life. So Jesus went to the cross for you. He's God. He became a man in order to go to the cross to die in my place, in your place, for our sin against God. And that death on the cross and his resurrection resurrection from the dead blew open a way for you and I to have a relationship with our creator, an intimate and real relationship where he, listen to this, where he places his life in you. And if he places his life in you, he places his power in you and all around you. And you can go through any storm with that power surrounding. Why don't you invite him into your life right now? Just bow, and here's how you reach out to him in faith. And how do you do that? Well, you can do that by praying. Let me help you with that. Okay, be sincere. Do it right now. Bow and pray something like this. Dear Father, (coughs) pardon me, dear Father, Thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for me. And thank you that you've already offered to me that if I ask, you will come into my life and forgive me of all of my sin. And I ask for you to do that now. I surrender, and I want you, Jesus, to be the Lord, the ruler of my life. I surrender to that. So please now come to live inside of me. Make me brand new. Give me new life. If you just prayed that with me, let me tell you, God keeps his promise. The God who cannot lie keeps his promise. And he's come into your life. Brand new life has been implanted in you, the life of Christ. And and you now have this power, this supernatural power living in you to help you walk through any storm. Hey, I want to invite you that if you just pray that, I I want to send you just a little link. It's just an automatic link that will help you get started right. And so if you just prayed with me, would would you find your device and just text this, BC Hope, the word, jammed up, BC Hope, to 84576. It's going to stay up for you. So so, uh, just uh, grab your device, text that. And if you'll do that, we'll send you this link. And if if you go to that link, you'll find this help. It's just like a Bible study. It's this help for how to start growing. Christ follower. The Holy Spirit is saying to you, yeah, it's not Jesus who's gone to sleep on you. It's you who's gone to sleep on him. So this is a moment for you to bow and surrender and find your faith. Take, Take your faith out and use him. God, I pray for every Christ follower. 
that you just give us the confidence and the poise that faith is a simple refusal to ask. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you so much for being a part of this service. So grateful that you joined us. I hope that you'll pick it back up. Come back and be with us next time. God bless you.